Well, we are finishing up our course tonight on why we are Baptists, our history and beliefs. Why we are Baptists, our history and beliefs. I want to begin tonight by reading just a few verses from Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, as we begin, and I'm going to ask the Lord's help after that. Here's what uh, verses 31 to 35 say of Acts chapter 4. It reads, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who had believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I am so thankful for the clarity of your word and describing how we should live as Christians, but also how we should live as churches. And even tonight, as we are talking about how individual local churches should be relating to each other and working together to further your kingdom, I pray, Father, that we would rejoice in the heritage we share as Baptists. We would acknowledge places where we need to acknowledge faults and where repentance was needed. And, Father, we would celebrate your providence through it all, and that through the legacy of those who've come before us, we can continue the work of bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth, and we can do that better together. We thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ. I pray that we would be excited to proclaim his name to the day we die. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to begin tonight by telling three stories. Three stories. The first story is in reference to our recent trip, our mission trip to Madrid, Spain. That's why I wasn't here two weeks ago. And uh, we took 42 people from our church. 28 of them were were students, teenagers from our church. And our youth group was engaged in ministering the gospel directly to those who were in Spain. But one of the really neat things about this trip, and the reason I'm mentioning to you right now, is because we got to work shoulder to shoulder with international mission board missionaries, IMB missionaries throughout the whole trip. Over a dozen of them we got to spend quality time with. Our teens got to hit the streets and hit the universities, sharing the gospel to lost people with them. And then each evening we got to hear from a different missionary or missionary couple describing the Lord's call upon their life to become a Christian, and then to become a missionary, and then specifically what job they do with the IMB. And it was really neat to hear because we got to hear all about different work that they do. And it's a variety of tasks that they're engaged in to be about the missionary task. Some of them were church planters in Madrid trying to plant a church with Spaniards in a very hard soil where a country that's less than uh, most 1% evangelical Christians Some of the missionaries work with university students at the University of Madrid or the other universities because it's a large university that's very international. And students come there from closed countries in the Middle East or in Asia where the gospel is not open or the countries aren't open to the gospel. They come there and they can share the gospel with them in that context and they can bring it back to their country. Some of the missionaries we talked to were logistics coordinators because it's just hard to live in a foreign country of all kinds of logistical challenges. And so their whole task is to serve the other missionaries by coordinating those details from logistics and finances and handling taxes and all that. Some of the missionaries are involved in member care because they have challenges and struggles and someone needs to counsel them. And it's kind of a unique challenge. One of the missionaries you heard from is is a medical coordinator. He gave up a job as a physician's assistant working in neurosurgery, making a lot of money to go in the mission field with his young family, and now he coordinates the medical care for 1,400 missionaries all over Europe and North Africa. And that's what he does to serve the cause of the Great Commission. What was neat about all this is that they were eager to work with us, not because our local church sent them, directly at least, 
But because of through the International Mission Board and our giving to the cooperative program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we actually do support all those missionaries. So in that sense, they are all our missionaries. And we get to have a partnership with them. And they were excited to work with us. And even beyond that, the local Baptist church we worked with there in Madrid, which was started by IMB missionaries a couple decades back, we got to join with them in worship. Our students sang a, a special choir song in their service. We celebrated communion with them. They had over 40 to 50 different nationalities in their church, and they were excited about us being with them, even though we're this Baptist church in Jacksonville they've never met. Because we shared a common confession and a common cause in the gospel. We cooperate together with them. And then that Friday night at this same local church, we had a combined youth service. We combined our youth groups together. We had a combined praise team of, team of students. And we had combined discussion groups of Spanish and international kids with our youth group kids and working together because it's just a visible display of our cooperation with this Baptist church in another continent that we've never even met before. But it was just a visible demonstration of the unity and cooperation we had to further the Great Commission because we share a common cause and a common Savior. And so it was on full display, our cooperation in this effort. That's the first story. Second story is something that took place just a few years ago, almost six years ago now, August 26, 2018, Here in Jacksonville was a video game tournament being held at a pizza place at the Jacksonville Landing. One of the participants at that landing lost his competition. He left, but then he returned with a handgun. And he used it to kill two people and wound ten more. The community of downtown Jacksonville was shaken to the core by what was dubbed a mass shooting. And it actually hit worldwide news. And because videos were posted on YouTube of the actual shooting itself, so it was getting a lot of coverage. And so within three days, our response to this was a group of Baptist churches in Jacksonville organized a Wednesday night vigil of service, of prayer, at the Jacksonville Landing property. And there's three main Baptist churches that work together. It was the First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Shiloh Baptist Church, and Trinity Baptist Churches. These three churches partnered together that night to preach the gospel, to sing hymns, and to give hope to a crowd of over 600 people that were gathered that night who were mourning and hurting and confused. People who lost a loved one, who didn't know the gospel, but they heard it with the combined effort of three different churches that night. One more story. The year was 1985. And the Southern Baptist Convention meeting at the First Baptist Church Dallas registered over 45,000 messengers that year. Conservatives in the Southern Baptist Convention were six years deep at this point in a battle with the liberals over the control of our denomination. It began with the presidency of Adrian Rogers in 1979, but just because the one conservative was elected president doesn't mean the convention was squarely and securely in the hands of conservatives, not yet at least. The liberals wanted to take the lead and bring the convention away from the inerrancy of Scripture, but conservatives weren't giving up the fight. So a conservative campaign went out across the nation to motivate Southern Baptist churches to send messengers, because that's the only way to take it back, is to send representatives from individual local churches to vote for a conservative president, which then has a ripple effect, of appointing conservative people to committees, then to trustee boards of different Southern Baptist entities, like the mission boards and the seminaries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the first linchpin to make it all work was the presidency. And the effort in 1985 worked because it was successful. Charles Stanley won the presidency that year. And many Baptist historians consider that the moment to be the watershed moment when the conservative resurgence won in taking back the Southern Baptist Convention or decidedly deciding not to go in a liberal direction. So these are three different stories, three different stories from Baptists. And the common thread that unites them all is that it highlights our final Baptist distinctive tonight that we're talking about. 
we believe that Baptists cooperate for the gospel. Baptists cooperate for the gospel. Whether it's in partnership with missionaries in another continent, or whether it's to minister to a city that's reeling after a tragedy, or it's to protect a convention from losing its biblical confession of faith. Baptists are committed to working together to protect the gospel, to care for others, and to fulfill the Great Commission. My goal tonight is to show you why Baptists are committed to this. Why Baptists are committed to this. I want to define what we mean and what we don't mean by cooperation, but as we get to our last of our Baptist distinctives, just a quick review of where we've been since this is our last week, and uh, I want to just pull this all together. So we've called this course Why We Are Baptists. In a sense, you could call this a, a Baptist distinctives class. So what is, it, what is it distinct about being a Baptist? That we're first a Christian. That's what we are, a Christian, but there's different types of Christians, right? And what type of Christian are we? Well, we, we, we put it on the, on the name out front, right? We're Baptists. We're a Baptist church. But what does it mean to be a Baptist? A lot of people have funny ideas about being a Baptist, right? Uh, you've heard them. I've heard them. People refer to how people dress or the music they listen to or, uh, or uh, the kind of food they eat. None of that has anything to do with being a Baptist. So what is it? Once again, right, and I try to summarize these just for the sake of simplicity on the back of your hand out there tonight. But Baptists are, we talked about the first week, Baptists are credo-Baptists. We believe that, um, uh, that um, you have to be a Christian because you profess, you are a Christian because you profess faith in Christ, not because your parents profess the faith in Christ. So we believe in believers' baptism only. That's what credo means, I believe in Latin. So you believe in Jesus, that's why you are baptized. So we believe in baptism based on your personal profession of faith, and it's done in water by immersion. And not only do we believe in a believers-only baptism, but we also believe in a believers-only church. So a church is congregational because it's made up of those who have undergone a believer's baptism, and only those who have, because they're the ones who have professed faith in Christ. It's not uh, recognize it's not ordered by a state or by a king or by a denominational entity. It's by each individual local church governing itself because they're made up of believers. They're the priesthood of every. Everyone has a priesthood in the sense that you're saved and Christ is your great high priest. And so you govern yourself as a local body of churches, a uh, local body of believers in one church. Baptists are also confessional. Just, just like you as an individual have to make a public profession of faith in baptism, a church also, because no one outside the church defines it for you, a church also must make a public profession of faith to define what it believes. It does so in its confession of faith. That's why Baptists have confessions of faith and always have. Baptists are confessional. And we're also rooted back to the ancient creeds and confessions because we're orthodox. Baptists are also committed to religious liberty. We believe you should be able to follow your conscience, and the state should not use its power to decide what you believe. You should have the freedom to choose to follow Christ. So we're committed to religious liberty. And as we talked about last time when I wasn't here, Baptists have been compelled by the Great Commission. It's not that we're the only ones committed to the Great Commission. It's that the Baptists not only are the International Mission Board, for instance, is the largest evangelical sending agency, missional sending agency in the world today. But even besides the scope of what we do, is that Baptists led the charge in initiating the modern missions movement. No other denominations were really wholesale sending missionaries to foreign lands until the Baptists started doing it. In Britain, with William Carey, and in America, with Adoniram Judson. And so we kind of paved the way for the modern mission movement. Baptists did that. And tonight, we're talking about Baptists are cooperating for the gospel. And in the same, what's relevant to all of these is that, you know what, when you hear these, you're like, well, I know other churches that, that practice believers' baptism. I know other churches that, that don't have a, an outside state control. And I know other churches that have confessions of faith. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You can find other types of churches or other denominations that have some 
of these distinctives, you probably will not find another denomination that has all of these distinctives, first of all. It's the cumulative effect of all of them together. But even beyond that, it's not just the accumulation, accumulation of all of these distinctives. It's that Baptists also, in most cases here, led the way in making these affirmations. So that's why they're considered rightly Baptist distinctives. We have a distinctive claim on them because they collectively define our identity and Baptists led the way in affirming them. So they kind of work together. You can't just pick out one or two that you like. It's all of them together that make us Baptists. And in many ways, the last one, cooperating for the gospel, is really tonight highlighting why we are Southern Baptists. So the title of the course is Why We're Baptists, and everything I've talked about so far has all predated the Southern Baptist Convention, which formed in 1845. You could say in a lot of ways tonight is why we are Southern Baptists. Uh, I'm going to go broader than that, but why we are Southern Baptists. Because there's different types of Baptists even today. But not all Baptists cooperate together for the gospel in the same way. Southern Baptists have brought a level of organizational and financial unity around our claim of cooperation in a way that other Baptist groups have not have not. So, why we are Baptists and why we are Southern Baptists. But let me first give some definitions. Our definition of Baptist cooperation, what do we mean when we talk about Baptists cooperating? Because in one sense, it could sound a little contradictory, right? I mean, here you are, Richard, you've been emphasizing that Baptists are independent congregations that are autonomous and independently governed. There's no outside structure or governance for each individual local church. So, wouldn't cooperation with other churches add some level of structure that therefore nullifies that? Well, no. I would just say that cooperation is kind of the flip side of the coin, the other side of the coin. Yes, Baptists believe in local church self-government, but this doesn't mean, and Baptists have never believed, that churches should be separate and siloed from one another. It's actually quite the opposite. What Baptists have practiced is that we should partner together as brothers and sisters in Christ to protect the gospel, to care for one another, and to fulfill the Great Commission. So we believe in the autonomy of the local church, and we believe that local churches should be associating with each other. We believe both in a congregational local government and a cooperation among churches. We can't just talk about one without talking about the other. They go together, and we should talk about them together. And this is also how um, our doctrinal statement talks about it. So our doctrinal statement, which again is the same as the doctrinal statement for the whole Southern Baptist Convention, the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, that's the latest edition, has a whole article dedicated to cooperation. It's a little long, but I'm going to go ahead and read it since this is our focus tonight. Here's, Here's what it says. It says, Christ people should, as occasion requires, organize such associations and conventions as may best secure cooperation for the great objects of the kingdom of God. Such organizations have no authority over one another or over the churches. They are voluntary and advisory bodies designed to elicit, combine, and direct the energies of our people in the most effective manner. Members of New Testament churches should cooperate with one another in caring for the missionary, educational, and benevolent ministries for the extension of Christ's kingdom. Christian unity in the New Testament sense is spiritual harmony and voluntary cooperation for common ends by various groups of Christ's people. Cooperation is desirable between the various Christian denominations when the end to be attained is itself justified and when such cooperation involves no violation of conscience or compromise of loyalty to Christ and his word as revealed in the New Testament. And there's a lot there. That's a long definition. But this statement gives us the essential description of what we mean by cooperation. We mean we should work together with other churches for the great objects of Christ's kingdom, things like defending the faith, spreading the gospel, encouraging and supporting the saints. Well, how how does this cooperation happen? 
Well, often it happens through the formation of associations or conventions. But notice that what we just read, the confession is very careful to clarify that these associations or conventions are not governing bodies. They don't actually hold any authority over local churches. A lot of times people misunderstand that. People come to our church if they're new to being a Baptist or being a Southern Baptist. They ask in membership class, well, what authority does the Southern Baptist Convention have over our church? Well, none. <laughs> uh, the Southern Baptist Convention only actually exists for like two days a year, every June. That's it. It doesn't actually exist other than when the annual meeting is taking place. It's a voluntary association that we decide, and it doesn't have any say over what we do as a local church, because we still believe in the independent self-governance of every local church. But we do believe there are some things that churches do better together than they can do on their own. There are some things that churches do better together than they can do on their own. The primary things are the sending of missionaries, the training of ministers, and the meeting of acute financial needs, right? It's really expensive and hard to send a missionary. It just requires a lot of expertise. It requires a lot of financial and practical support that most local churches are not equipped to give. Churches partnering together can do that better. Training of a minister, the kind of theological expertise that seminaries can collect in order to serve a group of churches is better than what any individual local church likely can offer. And there are times when disaster strikes. This happened a couple years ago when the hurricane wiped out a sister church of ours over on Sanibel Island. And they had nothing, but we had a lot. And so we offered finances. We took up an offering for them. We sent down teams of people to help when they needed some rebuilding efforts because they needed help and we sent help as another local church. And that's what churches can do better together than any local church can do on their own. We can say, well, no, you're an independent Baptist church. You help yourself. No, it just sounds hard-hearted, and it is. You wouldn't do that to your fellow Christian, and one fellow church shouldn't do that to another fellow church. So that's why we cooperate together. But how, how did this become a Baptist distinctive, if you will, if I can use that language? So what's the, what's the history of Baptist cooperation. How have we cooperated together? Well, just thinking back in history, as we look back at the very earliest church in the New Testament, which we're going to look at a few verses here in, in a minute, we, we see the New Testament church itself, uh, a, a picture of individual local self-governing churches partnering together. And they were doing this very well. And they set the precedent and model for us. So we'll, I'll go back and look at some of those verses in a, in a few minutes. But very early on, the church moved to an Episcopalian form of church government, where there was a bishop, a regional pastor, a bishop over a group of churches. And soon after that as well, Christianity got instituted as the official religion of the Roman Empire, and all of this gave way to what we know of today as the Roman Catholic Church, especially the medieval Roman Catholic Church, where it was a merger of state and church power with one bishop over all the churches. That's what the Roman Catholic Church means. It means the bishop in the city of Rome is the, church, is the bishop over the church universal, the church Catholic. So they believe that all churches are in submission to the bishop of Rome, as the Roman Catholic Church believes. And so when you don't do what they say, you're not voluntarily cooperating. They bring the coercive power not just of the church, but of the state. They use the government to suppress anyone who doesn't, doesn't want to voluntarily do what they tell them to do. Uh, you can see this pretty easily, right, in things like uh, the reformers, right? So the Protestant Reformation, when Luther and other reformers are trying to bring reform back to a biblical understanding of the gospel, well, they, um, they, they became fugitives of the state after the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated them because they weren't they were they were they were volunteering not to cooperate anymore, and so they were being coerced into believing. So that's kind of the backdrop to when Baptists show up in the scene. 
And so when the Baptists show up in the scene, when they're arguing for religious liberty, when they're arguing for congregational government, they're arguing with these things. They're separating themselves from the state power, from a bishop, from a king, telling them what to do. And they're forming independent, individual, self-governed, autonomous local churches. But they didn't think they were restarting Christianity, and they didn't think they were the only Christians. And they knew they had other brothers and sisters in other places, and they wanted to work together. We see this very clearly in the earliest Baptists. This all changed, especially with the particular Baptists in the early 17th century. The general Baptists, especially in the beginning, were more schismatic and separatistic, but the particular Baptists were not. Uh, even in their first confession of faith from the 1640s, they, they titled it a confession of faith of seven congregations of churches in Christ who are commonly but unjustly called Anabaptists. Right in the beginning, they, when they issued a confession of faith, they didn't just say, well, you write yours and you write yours and you write yours. No, they, they said, hey, we're all believing the same thing. Let's write it together to show common cause. And so they wrote this together. And in their confession, they described what they believed about cooperation. 1646 was a revision. The first edition was 1644, but most people quite quote the 46th version. But Article 47 says, And although the particular congregations be distinct and several bodies, everyone as a compact and knit city within itself, yet are they all to walk by one rule of faith, truth. So also they, by all means convenient, are to be are to have the counsel and help of one another, if necessity required, as members of one body in the common faith under Christ their head. So these Baptists recognize that we share one common Lord, Christ, we hold one rule of faith, and we should ask for advice from each other. We should work together. They said that right from the very beginning. They weren't trying to be individualistic and separatistic away from each other. No, that's what, what they did. And that was in the first London Confession. The second London Confession was actually, put, it says, put forth by the elders and brethren of many congregations of Christians baptized upon profession of their faith in London and the county. There's over, over 100, 130 churches by this point, and they're all putting forth a common confession together. And here's what they wrote. Paragraph 14 says, and as each church and all the members of it are bound to pray continually for the good and prosperity of all the churches of Christ. You're bound to pray for the prosperity of all the churches of Christ. Not just for your local church, all the churches, in all places, and upon all occasions to further everyone within the bounds of their places and callings and the exercise of their gifts and graces. So the churches when planted by the providence of God, so as they may enjoy opportunity and advantage for it, ought to hold communion among themselves for their peace, increase of love, and mutual edification. We should hold communion together. The very next paragraph says something similar. In cases of, and then, so sometimes we disagree, right? So what do we do then? Well, in cases of difficulties or differences, either in point of doctrine or administration, wherein either the churches in general are concerned, or any one church in their peace, union, and edification, or any member or members of any church are injured in or by any proceedings and censures not agreeable to truth and order, it is according to the mind of Christ that many churches holding communion together do by their messengers meet to consider and give their advice in or about that matter and difference to be reported to all the churches concerned. How by it these messengers assembled are not entrusted with any church power properly so called or with any jurisdiction over the churches themselves to exercise any censures either over any churches or persons or to impose their determination on the graces or officers. So in other words, what they're saying here is that it's prudential, right? It's wise, it's effective for churches to get together with one another to address problems they're facing. But these conclusions should be shared with all the churches, but they can't be imposed on the churches. They don't have any authority over the church, but they should come together because they hold communion together. Even more significant is the reason for this confession of faith. It was a uh, 
It was a baptized version of the Presbyterian Westminster Confession of Faith and the Congregational Savoy Declaration because they wanted to show unity even with other denominations where they could, of other Christians beyond even the Baptists. So it was common cause in the kingdom of Christ because they didn't think that Baptists were the only Christians. There's other Christians besides Baptists, and we should all work together. So, and this was also demonstrated in the Baptist Missionary Society. We talked, Ryan, Pastor Ryan talked about this last time. But when Baptists decided, uh, it, it, William Carey, he had a burden to bring the gospel to the heathen, as they were called at the time. And he was reading shipping logs about the British Empire going all over the world, reading the adventures of G Captain John Cook. And he's like, well, look, if they can go there, and for other purposes, we can jump on the same ships and bring people the gospel. He got his globe out, and he read navigational routes, and he said, I want to go. There's people that don't know the gospel. Will you send me? He didn't just say, I'm just going to go because I feel like going. He asked the churches to send him. Missionaries shouldn't just independently decide to go. They asked churches to send them. And he didn't just ask one local church to send them. He asked a whole association of churches to send him. And so they formed 14 people came together in 1792 and formed the Baptist Missionary Society. And with, by the end of the decade, by 1800, it involved hundreds of churches in England and Wales all partnering together to send missionaries to the other side of the continent. And most of the people they sent never came home. Never came home. Some of them died within weeks of arriving there after preparing for years. But they wanted to go anyway. Because they know if they didn't go, that people wouldn't hear the gospel. They were asking to be sent. And the Baptists sent them. They said, will you be our rope holders? But not just one individual, not just one church, a group of churches partnering together. said, we'll hold the rope as you go down into the pit to bring the gospel to India and Burma and the other places in South Asia. But it wasn't just the British Baptists. This also happened in America. So as American Baptist churches were being started, they very quickly formed associations. And all this is, all this is pre-revolutionary, right? This, all this is colonial America. So there was no, these are all just British colonies at the time. They weren't individual states. The Philadelphia Baptist Association was the first one. It became the prototype that all other Baptist associations modeled. When Baptists planted churches, they didn't just plant churches and stop. They planted churches, and those churches formed associations. And those associations held communion together to make sure they walked by the same rule of faith, to watch over doctrinal controversies together, and to partner together to plant other churches. Baptists did this in America from the very beginning. They didn't just plant a church. They started associations of churches, modeled after the Philadelphia Baptist Association in the north, and then from them in the south from the Charleston Baptist Association in 1751 started by Oliver Hart. He wrote that to, it was founded, the association was founded to promote the kingdom of the Redeemer through maintenance of love and fellowship by mutual contribution for peace and welfare of the churches. Because here's the deal. The kingdom of Christ is furthered and advanced when it's not just your church that's healthy, but all the churches in the area are healthy. We should not rejoice when other gospel-preaching churches in Jacksonville fail. Because guess what? There's a lot of lost people. There. All the churches aren't filled up, okay? We can have a lot more services here. A lot of people did not come to church on Easter Sunday. We were busting the doors. We'd overflow seating. But a lot of people were sitting home in their pajamas because they don't care at all about Christ. Until every church in Jacksonville is overflowing with people, our goal is not done. I mean, really, we're not done until the whole city is one. And so we are having investment in every church being a healthy church. And that's how they thought. Later, Richard Furman took over the association, and he included in it mission, seminary education. Because he said, look, if we want to have healthy churches, plural, we need well-trained pastors to go pastor these churches. What's the point of having a group of churches if we can't have faithful gospel ministers pastoring them? So we have an investment in seminaries being faithful because they're pumping out our future pastors. And if they're not preaching the gospel and being faithful, then the whole, the whole denomination and association and churches will all fall away as well. 
And so this paved the way for the first Baptist state convention, which was in South Carolina, founded in 1821. And many more state conventions would follow. We now, for instance, are part of the Florida Baptist Convention. All this was very intentional as Baptists formed. And Baptists also formed national conventions, not just local associations and not just state conventions. They formed national conventions as Baptists were growing in America. And so we talked about this a little bit last time, Pastor Ryan did, when Adoniram Judson came back, and guess what? He wasn't a Congregationalist anymore. He was a Baptist. He went to the Baptist churches. Hey, would you send me back to Burma to preach the gospel? And they formed the Triennial Convention. It was called such because they met every three years. And the whole purpose was to come together to send missionaries away from America to places there they didn't have the gospel. Richard Furman was elected the president, and the, and the stated purpose was to support international missions. Eventually, as the Baptists were relatively united in America, but unfortunately, it was over the issue of slavery. There was deep division. The same issues that led to the Civil War also fractured the Baptists. There was controversy over whether or not the Baptists would be willing to send a slaveholder as a missionary. The Northern Baptists said, no, we will not. The Southern Baptists, because they were in the South, wanted to. And so that's what led to the split between the North and South Baptists. The Northern Baptist Convention, which eventually became the American Baptist Convention, which is now kind of splintered to a lot of different groups. The Southern Baptist Convention kind of stayed together as a convention of churches, but it has a, has a tangled formation. It was in defense of slavery that the Southern Baptists separated from the Northern Baptists, or really vice versa. But uh, Southern Baptists have been clear to um, express publicly in formal resolutions that was sinful to, uh, to uh, defend slavery, and they've renounced that and repented of that. It's no longer part of who we are as a convention of churches. Now we have a convention of churches that have lots of ethnicity. Our convention of churches has lots of ethnicities. We've even had, um, we've even had a president of Southern Baptist Convention a couple years ago, Fred Luter, who was an African-American. And I think that represents us moving beyond the beginning. But even then, even though the genesis of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, the split was because of tensions around slavery, from the very beginning, the aim was noble. They said quote, that the convention was started to direct the energies of the whole denomination in one sacred effort, the propagation of the gospel. From the very beginning, they recognized if we're going to legitimize our convention of churches, it's got to be because we're uniting together in one sacred effort to bring the gospel where it has not been named to send missionaries to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so that has been the stated mission of the Southern Baptist Convention from the very beginning. Now here's the quote. One sacred effort. And so the goal of all these associations and conventions that I just reviewed here was cooperation. They desire to partner together to protect the gospel, to care for one another, to raise up pastors through education, and to fulfill the Great Commission. But it's important to remember that all these structures that have been built, these associations, the state conventions, the national conventions, none of them are structures with hierarchical authority. They're all voluntary associations. Each individual Baptist church maintains its local church governance. No one tells us how to spend our money. No one tells us who to elect as pastors and deacons of our church. No one tells us how to arrange the chairs in the classroom or what to teach from the pulpit. Each local church decides that for themselves. So these structures are built up so like churches of like faith and practice can cooperate on what we do better together than what we can do on our own. And in Southern Baptist world, in the Southern Baptist world, a big step was taken in this direction with the formation of the cooperative program in 1925. What the cooperative program did is essentially create a unified budget for the Southern Baptist Convention. So we decide how much money to give or not give to this cooperative program. In, in general, right now, 
uh, from, our, from our general operating budget, we give 3% is what we voted on. Last, our church votes on the budget, so we vote on this. Uh, we voted on setting 3% of our giving to the cooperative program. That money first goes to the state convention, Florida Baptist Convention. They, each state convention decides how much to keep and how much to pass along. I think it's like a 49-51 split. They keep 49% in Florida. They get 51%, and that goes to then a bunch of other entities. It goes to the six different seminaries, goes to the International Mission Board, goes to the North American Mission Board, goes to the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, goes to Send Relief. Uh, that's how the money gets divided up. But this cooperative program, starting in 1925, was the engine that fueled being able to send so many missionaries around the world. Because even though we have thousands of churches in the Southern Baptist Convention, most of them are pretty small. Most of them are pretty small. Most of them would not have the ability to send any missionary. They can barely support a pastor, one pastor. But by uniting funds together, we're able to send, right now, uh, there's some 3,500 international missionaries on the field in the Southern, in the, with the International Mission Board. If you include their kids, the 6,000 personnel on the field around the world being sent out by our cooperative program giving that we're able to be part of. And so this cooperative program, it is dispersed, right, primarily, primarily for missions and education. So it goes and funds the seminaries. It goes so that every student, so if we send a student from our church, we have to approve them as a church. We, we say, yes, we approve them for theological education as part of the application process. They, most, most of our Southern Baptist seminaries will give them a, a half-price discount. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll get tuition half the price because they're coming from a Southern Baptist church. And then some churches, like ours, have other scholarship funds upon approval to supplement uh, the rest of the tuition, things like that. So that's some of the ways that we undergird that. So our Southern Baptist seminaries, I believe, at least some of them, like Southern Seminary and Midwestern Seminary, for instance, two of our six, you could, there's six of them all together, I think are two of the largest and two of the best seminaries in the world to this day, with the best collection of faculty. And they're able to get, students are able to get a world-class education for a fraction of what they'd have to pay at a non-denominational seminary because of our cooperative program giving. So we can send more people. And you, if you just want to take classes at seminary and online or in the evening or whatever, you can do that. And as a member from a church, you can get half price. Lots of people do that. We have Sunday school teachers that do that. And then our North American missions, it goes to things like co collegiate ministry, church planning, disaster relief, all that is part of it. So in 2022, Southern Baptists contributed $450 million to the cooperative program. Our church individually... Last year, in 2023, we gave to the cooperative program $286,000 is what we gave to the cooperative program. Uh, another exciting development happened in Southern Baptist Convention life with the, what we know of today as the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. So Charlotte Lottie Moon, Charlotte Moon, whose nickname was Lottie, that's where the name Lottie comes from, her name's Charlotte, Charlotte Moon, was a missionary sent to China, Southern Baptist missionary. She was in China from 1873 to 1912. And while she was there, she was overwhelmed by the lostness, by the need, by the need to send more missionaries to China. It was such a massive country with so many lost people. So she was writing furiously letters back to the Baptist churches here in America, asking for more missionaries to be sent, asking for more money to be raised up to be able to send more missionaries. And she did this for years and years and years. And eventually, in, in 1888, they took up an offering. And uh, all of the money for that offering goes directly to international missions. It doesn't go to the state conventions. It, goes, it doesn't go to church planning in the states. It doesn't go to collegiate ministry. It all goes directly to international missions. And in 1918, six years after her death, it got renamed after her. So it wasn't called after her, well, in her lifetime that came afterwards. 1918. And so in 2022, Southern Baptists gave almost $196 million through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our church last year, uh, the goal for all the Southern Baptist churches was $200 million this last year. They haven't finished tallying it yet, or at least they haven't released it. Our church gave, just for that one offering that goes to international missions, $214,000.
$214,000. So all together, between the cooperative program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we gave over half a million dollars as a church to advance the cause of the Great Commission in cooperation with other Baptist churches. So we're in deep. <laughs> we're in for a pound, right? We're, we're committing half a million dollars a year as one local church to cooperate with other Baptist churches to send missionaries and to train ministers primarily. That's what the money's being used for. And so this is the historical picture for how Baptists cooperated together and why we call it a Baptist distinctive. Because no other evangelical group is fueling their funding like that. That's why I call it a Baptist, a Baptist distinctive. But what's a theology of Baptist cooperation? How, how should we think about this biblically? Well, as you just think about in the, in the New Testament itself, we see a deep cooperation among the churches. Sometimes it's, it's little phrases that you might just pass over when you're reading the New Testament. But all over the New Testament, we see what's happening here is a demonstration of deep cooperation. So just think of some of these verses here, like just Romans 16, 16. It says, all the churches greet you. Well, how do they all know about him? Why do they care? Because they're all invested together. Or 2 Corinthians 8, 18. They shared preachers and missionaries together. We are sending the brother who's famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. So they're, they're sharing preaching and preachers and missionaries among each other. Or Romans 15, 25 and 26, they supported one another financially. Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. The same thing happened in Acts 11. The church in Antioch took up money and relief for the churches in Judea. They're a different ethnicity. Sometimes we forget they're different language and ethnicity. But they're fellow Christians that had financial need because of earthquakes that happened in Jerusalem and Judea at the time. And so churches that had more money, or some of them didn't even have a lot of money, but they raised up money to send to other churches on the other side of the Mediterranean in support and help of them. They were doing this in the earliest decades of the church. Local churches helping other local churches financially because they had need and they wanted to help each other. 1 Thessalonians 1.7 shows how they helped one another grow in their faith. You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The whole regions knew about their example. Acts 15.22, they worked together to resolve theological disputes and they communicated to the wider church. The church in Jerusalem said it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, plural, with the whole church. I mean, at this point, thousands of people were Christians in, in Jerusalem to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They're sending representatives to other churches and they're sending the theological summary statement they drew up to solve controversies and they send it to other churches to help them doctrinally. That was their intent to work together to do that. 1 Corinthians 16, 1, Paul tells them they're commanded to cooperate. This is now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia, so you also are to do. He's telling groups of churches to collect money, and I'm going to come by and pick it up and bring it to other Christians and other churches. They were commanded to do that. That was happening in the New Testament. Why do we see all these New Testament churches cooperating like this? What was animating them theologically to do this? Well, well, in the New Testament church and Baptists today cooperate for the gospel because we share three things. We share three things of all these other churches. First of all, we share the same Christ. We have one Lord and Savior. 1 Corinthians 1-2 says, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together, with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. He's not just our Lord, he's yours too. We're all called by the same Lord. That's why we need to work together. We share the same Christ. Every true church is serving and submitting to the same Lord. So we have an undeniable unity with one another. And because of that, we should cooperate with one another. Also, we share the same confession. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. There's one body and one spirit, 
Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Just as this, the church universal has one Lord, it also has one confession. We teach the same gospel. There's only one gospel message that we're preaching. If you are a legitimate church, you are preaching the true gospel. If you're not, it's, it's definitional to your existence. If a church is not preaching the gospel, it's not a church. It might have church in the sign. It might call itself a church. If it's not preaching the historic message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, it's not a church. It's not a church. The Mormon church is not a church. Churches that are Methodist church, Presbyterian churches that are liberal churches are not a church. Baptist churches that are liberal churches are not a church. But any church that is preaching the gospel, the gospel that saves, the gospel that we export around the world is a true church. And we should want to help them preach the gospel. And we should cooperate with them because we share the same confession. And even more specific than as Baptists and as Southern Baptists, we have crystallized that common confession in a doctrinal unity we call the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. We have assurance that when we send our money to the cooperative program, it's only going to churches that have the same confession of faith. And so that's why we need to fight to make sure that churches have to follow that confession of faith to stay part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Otherwise, the basis of our doctrinal unity erodes and falls apart. It's one of the things we're fighting for this summer at the convention meeting. And not only do we share the same Christ and the same confession, we share the same commission. We have the same goal, right? To preach the gospel, to go to the ends of the earth. Every church should be furthering Christ church, Christ kingdom, through working together to see it accomplished. And so practically speaking, what should this look like? How, what should we do with this attempt at cooperation? What's the practice of Baptist cooperation? How do we do it here at our church, and what should you do? Well, very practically, I mean, it, it sounds almost trite, but it's just how it works. You need to give to the mission. Give to the mission. Baptists cooperate together by giving to the mission. When you give to our local church, we proportion, as I just described, a percentage of that to be in cooperation with other Baptist churches in order to train ministers and to send missionaries. Because we're invested in the health of other Baptist churches and we're invested in the health of church planning efforts around the world. And so when you give to the mission, it's going to fund cooperative gospel efforts in our church, in our city, in our state, throughout our nation, and most importantly, I believe, around the world. And so don't just, sometimes people get pet projects and they want to, well, I want to just give to this thing because I really care about this thing. Well, you know what? Our church collectively votes on a budget that we think is most wise. And we have percentage distribution and all that. And you should just give to that. You should just give. I understand you're excited about certain things. That's fine. You can give extra to that, I guess, if you want. But just give to the budget because the budget fuels our mission. The budget fuels our mission as a church. And... Baptists cooperate by, together, by praying for other churches. I hope you're praying for our church. We should pray for other churches too. You should want other churches that are preaching the gospel to be successful. Pray for their commitment to the gospel. Pray for our convention of churches. We're at a, kind of a crossroads, a Southern Baptist, whether or not we're going to stay unified around certain affirmations around the Bible. Pray for leaders in our convention and pastors in our convention. Download the IMB Pray app. The IMB has a Pray app. You can grab a little prayer guide for Miss Connie after class. You can use a paper one, or if you like the digital version, download the Pray app. Download Voice of Martyrs. Pray for Christians that are being persecuted around the world. There are brothers and sisters in Christ. And thinking about them by praying for them will give you a heart to care about them. And not just about the little world we live in. And lastly, Baptists cooperate together in kingdom progress. What I, and why, the reason I mention this here is because I want to encourage you to resist the urge to get turfy. It's just easy to get that, turf, you know, get that way. Well, what's your church doing? Well, our church is doing this. Our church is better than your church. Well, I'm glad you love your church. You should be excited about your church. And you should want other people to want to come to your church because you enjoy your church. But other people are part of a faithful gospel-preaching churches, 
You should celebrate that. You should encourage them in that. You should rejoice in that. Any win for the kingdom of Christ is a win for you and is a win for First Baptist Jacksonville because we're on Team Christ. And we're trying to make sure Christ's kingdom is what's built up, not our church kingdom. And so rejoice in anywhere this kingdom progress for the gospel because it's a win for us because we share the same Christ, same confession, and the same commission. Paul even said this, right? We're studying Philippians right now. I'll close with just a couple passages from Philippians. Paul says that some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. If Christ is being proclaimed, even if it's for bad motives, he's saying he still rejoices in that. Because that's what his heart is beating for, the advance of the kingdom of Christ. So, you know, Southern Baptists aren't perfect. Southern Baptist Convention has never been perfect from the very beginning. And I don't know what the future of our Southern Baptist Convention is going to be. We're not committed forever and ever, no matter what. So the Southern Baptist Convention, if the Southern Baptist Convention of churches moves in a liberal direction and we can't re-steer it, then we won't stay with it as a church because we're committed to making sure that our money is going to gospel preaching. But right now, that's not where we're at yet. And so we need to fight for the doctrinal faithfulness and purity of our convention of churches. We're invested in other churches being healthy. And if it can stay faithful over the last hundred some odd years, the International Mission Board has proved to be a tool that God has used mightily to further the gospel around the ends of the earth. And I'm excited, if nothing else, because of a couple of our seminaries and our mission, foreign mission board to be the Southern Baptist. That's the thing that is, I think, our crown jewel of Southern Baptist, the International Mission Board. And we should be excited about staying together as churches to support that if we can remain faithful. So as we conclude the course, I hope you are excited about being a Baptist because ultimately we believe it's what most closely reflects what the New Testament teaches. And our history is an attempt at faithfulness to the Bible, most importantly. Let me close in prayer. Oh, Father, I'm so thankful to be with this group of saints in this church, and I'm so thankful for our church to be with other faithful gospel-preaching churches to unite together. I pray, God, for our convention of churches. I ask that you continue to use Southern Baptist to bring the gospel around the world. I pray, God, that you would keep our convention faithful and united doctrinally so that we can be united missionally. And I pray, God, for many churches that are wrestling with that right now, that you would give them strong leaders that will stay focused on furthering the kingdom of Christ. I'm so thankful for this course and the efforts we had to understand better our Baptist history and, most importantly, the Bible. I pray, God, that we leave here united as a body of believers in this church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.